avid orange leader, World War II veteran at his home, 1891 Briarcliff Circle, 1899 uh, Briarcliff Circle, Atlanta, Georgia 30329. My name is David Glesham, and he is a friend of my uncle Fred Schwartz. And Mary is my grandfather's sister. No, no, no. He didn't. Freddie no. married. <laughs> Uncle Freddie. My wife will enjoy. Let's see that. That was my phone. Um, so, could you? Could you start. Abbott, could you state the... Start. Is this enough? Yeah. Abbott, could you state the rec for the record your full name, what branch of the military you served in, what was your rank, and where did you serve? Then proceed with your introduction, induction when, where, when and where it was. How old were you, and were, and were you drafted, or did you enlist, and at what age? Proceed with your experiences in the military, end with your discharge, and how war changed your life. You will have an hour and a half, and I will have, I will wave my hand when I have a question, and a, a half hour before your time is up. We appreciate, we appreciate you doing this. Your interview will be filed with the Atlanta Historical Society and at the Library of Congress. You can start now. Okay, my name is Abbott Torrent Licker. I live at 1899B, Brancliffe Circle, Atlanta, Georgia. And at the start of World War II, I was working in uh, Quincy, Massachusetts, which is a suburb of Boston. I was manager of a chain shoe store. And uh, I received my draft notice and I had a high number. I did not uh, enlist. At that time I was 28 years old and uh, when uh, Pearl Harbor happened, I went right away to my draft board and said I'm ready to go in. I had already resigned from my position with my company and they told me, don't worry, we'll get you. We want to get the younger ones first. So, but just so it happened about three weeks later, they called me in and uh, they sent me to Fort Bragg, North Carolina for artillery uh, training. Well, the training I got there was uh, as a uh, telephone line man. They trained me how to climb these poles and uh, splice wires and work on switchboards and all that. Well, I learned that. It took about two months, and I got pretty good training in that. So when time came for me to go to my regular army outfit, they sent me up to Pine Camp, New York, uh, which is now called Camp Drum, and uh, which is right practically on the uh, St. Lawrence River facing Canada. Uh, we arrived there, about nine of us from my outfit Fort Bragg. It was freezing cold. Uh, that part of the country is extremely cold, but it's a dry cold. You don't feel it until it's too late. Anyhow, and I got there. Uh, it was the end of, uh, let's see, no, it was the beginning of March, and the snow was piled up high in the ground. When you got in there, they issued me uh, parkas and snowshoes and skis and uh, all the equipment that goes with uh, winter training. Well, I reported to my company commander's office, and uh, he said, what is your specialty? I said, well, I'm a telephone line man. He said, we don't have them in the armored division. Uh, this was the 4th uh, uh, Armored Division, uh, part of the 3rd Army. That was the tanks, is that right? That's right, tanks. Uh, the company commander started laughing, and I said, why are you laughing? He said, because we don't use telephones anymore. We use radios now. We eliminated telephones quite a while ago. He said to me, well, I don't, what shall I do with you? And he said, do you have a driver's license? I said, yes. He said, you are my Jeep driver from now on, which was a great job. I didn't have to fall out for these other items uh, for a while. Uh, in 
initially, though, I had to. Uh, they they wanted me to go into KP and uh, do guard duty, which uh, none of us like, especially KP. And I said to one of the fellows working there, "How do you get out of doing KP?" He said, "You have to become a corporal." Well, before long, very short time, I became a corporal. And, uh, and we trained up at Pine Camp, and then from there we went to Tennessee Maneuvers. And this was around September, and we were in Maneuvers until November. And uh, our base headquarters at that time was below Nashville, and we maneuvered up and down from Nashville to Chattanooga, through the Cumberland Mountains and the Cumberland River and all that. And that gave me a chance to come down to Atlanta here and a sister living here at the time. And I spent a weekend with them, the first time I had ever been in Atlanta. Well, anyhow, went back to uh, camp and uh, we were told that we're going to California for desert maneuvers. We got there. We were in the Indio Desert training for a while, and then we went to the Mojave Desert. Uh, at, at that time, uh, my, the 4th Armored Division was considered a, a uh, no-account division. I mean, training was poor, and it seemed to everything went wrong. While we were training there, we received notice that we were going to go overseas to North Africa to fight Rama. So they gave us a week's uh, furlough to, uh, so I could go back to the East Coast to visit my family who lived in uh, Massachusetts. Well, eventually I got back to camp and they were taking our ODs, our heavy outfit. No, they were taking our cockies away that we were going to use in North Africa, and they were giving us ODs, the heavier type uniforms. And I questioned them. They said, well, we're not going to North Africa after all because Rommel has been defeated, and, they're going, and the uh, troops there are going to fight in uh, uh, Sicily, Italy, and so forth. Well, anyhow, they sent us to Texas for training, uh, Camp Bowie, Texas. And we trained there for a while. And uh, oh, incidentally, I, I forgot to mention that while on maneuvers, one of the tanks in our outfit was a Ford Observer tank. It's going over the Cumberland River and uh, over these pontoon bridges and it sunk, and the uh, the uh, driver of the tank drowned. So the sergeant, who was the tank commander, came over and he said he refused to go in the tank anymore, even though they they break him down to a private, which they did. Next morning, the company commander calls me in, and he said to me, "You are now a sergeant. You're a tank commander." I, I questioned that. I said, I, I don't have any experience. He says, you'll get it in <laughs> no time. So what do I have to know about it? He said, go over to the quartermaster's tent, and the sergeant there will explain things to you. So I went over, and I said, What's, what do I have to do? In the first place, you have to sign for the tank. In case you lose it, it's going to cost you $75,000. <laughs> the same tank today would probably cost seven and a half million dollars. Well, anyhow, I said, uh, you know, I, I can't afford seventy-five thousand dollars. He says, don't worry. If you lose it, they write a statement of charges, and you won't be charged for it. But if you lose a shovel off the tank, then you'll have to pay for it. I never lost a shovel of mine. Well, anyhow, uh, we trained. I trained as a foreign observer uh, down in Texas, and before long we were on a train heading for a point of embarkation. Uh, they uh, put the lines, you know, the 
blinds, they pulled them down the train so we wouldn't know where we were going. We couldn't see anything out of it or whatnot. And we, we rode that way for about three days. Finally got to our destination and we came out. It was 15 miles from my hometown in Taunt, Massachusetts, Camp Miles Standish. Well, every night I got a pass and went home to see my folks. Finally, the company commander called me and he said, I understand you live around here. I said, yes, sir. He said to me, you, you can no longer get a pass. We're a secret outfit. No one is supposed to know where we are and uh, where we're going. Nobody's supposed to know our division is here. Well, the girls from my hometown used to come in uh, to host us at the USO. And I grew up with them. As a matter of fact, at Camp Barber, where I get a heck of was my barber at home. Right? So anyhow, uh, I found a, a way to get out of the back of the camp. I used to pass and I used to go home every night. Anyhow, I don't think they would have caught Marshall Day if they caught me because we were due to go overseas. We finally got on a train and headed for Boston. And uh, the wharf that the uh, boat was on was the same wharf that there were restaurants on before the war and also after the war that I used to go to occasionally. So it was like old homely. We headed for England. Uh, we were on a, a group of uh, ships. And the, at that time, I guess it was all the time, that the uh, fastest ship in the convoy could only go as fast as the slowest ship. So, and we were worried because there were the uh, German submarines all around the place. And, uh, and they were causing a lot of havoc at that time. Well, we heard some uh, firing up above. We were kept down below and we questioned what happened. We were, we were being fired upon by the enemy. No, they were just trying out the machine guns and so forth in case they ran into something. Well, our boat ran into trouble and the convoy had to leave us. We were all alone in the uh, midst of the Atlantic Ocean and submarines all around. And uh, that was the first really worry we had. But then they repaired the problem when we finally reached the convoy and uh, we came down through the Irish Channel and landed in Wales at Cardiff. Uh, we got on trains there and we got over to past Bristol and they landed my outfit at, in the western part of uh, England about 90 miles west of London. And we set up headquarters there. A number of interesting things happened there. Uh, we were very close to Strawberry Plains where the famous Stonehenge is. You've heard of the Stonehenge. But well, we went maneuvers to the plains there. And of course, at night we had to sleep on the ground, you know. And when did I sleep? Right next to the Stonehenge. And uh, the company commander called me in one day and he said to me, I understand you had retail experience. I said, yes, sir. He said, I want you to uh, run our PX here at the camp. Well, he saw I was hesitant about it because I knew that have to be a lot of night work and weekend work and I wanted to get out and see him. He said, well, come in a few days, let me know if you'll take this position. So I said, yes, sir. And I came in, called me in a few days later and he said, you're going to start <laughs> next week. That was <laughs> the way I could uh, decide what I wanted to do at that time. Well, that was the best deal I had. They gave me a, a private to help me with the uh, PX, 
And I said to him, I said, suppose we alternate. I'll take one weekend off and you take the other weekend off. He said, me, Sergeant? He says, no. He said, I don't want to go anywhere. I'm saving up my money when I get home back in the U.S. Uh, when I want to get married. He said, you can have every weekend off, which I did. <laughs> what a break that was. I used to go to London almost every week. And I had a relative there. And uh, I really was dying in wine while well, in London. Well, eventually, one day, uh, the company commander called me and he said, you know, we're about ready to go over to uh, Normandy. He said, you're going to have to close up the PX. So I said to him, now what do I do? I've got a lot of merchandise there. He said, you can do whatever you want with it, but just let me have the cigars and the cheese. <laughs> I said, all right with me. So I went and tried to divvy up everything. We had cigarettes and cookies and candies and, uh, and soap. And I divvied up among all the fellas in our camp there. And we still had quite a bit left over after that. So I got hold of those, I don't know if you remember, but they had these old cookie tins. They used to keep loose cookie, cookies in, in the grocery stores. And I filled those up with the cigarettes and the candy and the cookies and so on. And I tied them. Now my vehicle was a half track at that time. You know what a half track is, don't you? No. The front of the uh, vehicle were big rubber tires and the back were tank treads. And I tied them underneath the uh, vehicle in case we ran into a, a rough spot when we were over in France. Well, anyhow, we finally got on these boats and they took us over. Uh, fighting had been going on in Normandy for a few weeks, and the reason we couldn't get there early is because they had so many heavy vehicles. They had to get space on land there for us to land our vehicles. So we got over there. To, uh, I landed in Butchhead, Utah Beachhead, and uh, we got ready to go toward the. Uh, of operations. We got into a spot uh, close to the battlefield. The shooting was going on all around. I'll tell you, one of the first things that really disturbed us is we were going to the battlefield. A lot of these fat truck, flat trucks were coming down the highway and they're covered with tarps and you could see GI's legs and hands sticking out, dead bodies, you know, that are coming from that from That really uh, struck us. Well, we got to the uh, battlefield, and uh, we were told we were going to swap places with the 4th Infantry Division. I was in the 4th Army Division. And they were the ones that had landed originally at Cuba. And we were going to take over their spots and their foxholes and what. And at the dead of the night, we crept up and we swapped places. They crept back to safety and we took over their front lines. And uh, I noticed over in the, the foxhole near me, still one of the soldiers there. I whispered to him, buddy, you better get going. Didn't answer. About an hour later, a couple of GIs quote, came and he, he was dead body, and they pulled them out and took them back. Well, anyhow, we, uh, we were there for a while, and we finally got into the hedgerow country. You know what a hedgerow is? The farmers in France for many years, instead of putting fences up around their property, their fields, they used to build mounds, bushes and trees, and they build up over the years. And uh, we were having problems there because the Germans had already figured exactly where our troops were going to be in the hedgerows, and they zeroed in on them. 
and they used to fire these 88s, which was the most feared shell during the war. And, uh, and many times we'd creep, uh, get on this side of the hedge run during the, the other side we'd throw hand grenades at each other across the uh, miles there. Well, while we were waiting there, trying to break through, uh, to go through France, uh, a company commander used to call me and say, Sergeant, you you're going to have to take a patrol. One night he told me, he said, now you take your, your squad across the field there, and I want you to capture a few German soldiers and find out where the artillery is because they kept firing the artillery constantly at us. So, I took my squad and we crept all night long across the field. We got close enough to hear the voices. Well, the chances of our capturing any Germans were very slight, but we knew, we found out where the artillery was, and we crept back early morning got back to uh, my outfit. Of course, during night, the Germans used to throw up flares, and we froze so that they wouldn't uh, notice us. A few days later, some of the Corps of Engineers came to us and wanted to know, they wanted to know what squad was that they crept over to the German side. Yep, yeah, that light is on. Okay. Oh, yeah. So, during the time we're waiting to break through, uh, I went on quite a number of patrols. One day, I took my uh, squad and went ahead looking for a, a German outpost, and we came upon them. Now, before I go on with this, before we went on these uh, patrols, we, knew, we never knew how long it would take, whether we'd get back the same day or not. Well, we didn't have the infantry type jacks, you know, with the pocket here and there. We had the armor division jack with the zipper and side pockets. Well, I used to fill my side pockets, you know, with the hand grenades and whatever, because we had bandoliers all the rest. But food, that was a problem. Well, we had K-rations, you know, with cans in them of, like, pork and beans and uh, eggs. And, and I stuck one in my jacket here. We ran into this German outpost. They started firing. I got hit in the chest. And I killed over, and I was a little bit of shock. And I fell down. It was mushy. And I said, my God. I really didn't feel anything. So when they came, pulled me back to the uh, our line, and the medic says to me, the lucky SOB, he says, do you know that can of pork and beans saved your life? I said, I sure am thankful for that. Well, anyhow, it was written up, you know, in the Yank magazine, and uh, what was the other one? Uh, Stripes and Stripes? Stripes and Stripes, that's right. Well, anyhow, eventually my division broke through at uh, Coutance and Abranches, which were uh, large cities, fairly large cities, uh, along the route to, uh, this was still a nominee on the way to Bur Brittany. We broke through there. And we really wrecked the city. The whole city was in ruins. But that was the only way to get through. The Germans had control. And we pushed our way all the way down to Lorient uh, on the Gulf. What was the name of the Gulf? I forget now. Uh, Biscay, I think it was. Biscay. Thompson, man. Yeah. So we surrounded the city, but we never could take the city. The Germans had these large the guns pointed out the seas, and they turned them around and pointed them at us. And they were shelling us, and we couldn't get 
anywhere near. But General Patton was uh, commander in chief, decided that our division was too good at that time to stay there just to hold the Germans at bay. So he brought in a uh, fresh division who hadn't had any experience, and they took over, and we started going through France. We went through a lot of large cities there, uh, Orleans, and uh, I'm trying to think of the name of the cities. Well, anyhow, mm -hmm. it was uh, St. Joan of Arc country there. And uh, we were uh, stuck in a town called Vulcoliers. I'll never forget that town because that's where St. Joan lived with the man. We've been there. We've oh, you, you know where it is. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, we were stuck there. The reason why, we couldn't get uh, gasoline, food, or ammunition up to us. They were sending it to Montgomery, and at that time, I remember Patton raised a lot of hell about that, but it didn't do any good. We still had to wait. And we were near the uh, Moselle River, and uh, I remember one time we waded across the Moselle River with our rifles up above, up to here. We got near the side, and the Germans spot us and were shooting at us. Well, all we could do was uh, wade back and get on our own side, because they were killing uh, men left and right. We got over on the other side, and we were exhausted. We laid down on the ground. It was getting kind of cool. And not one man, man caught, caught cold. We were all soaking wet. And I got back to this country after the war, went into a room, opened the window, and I caught cold right away. <laughs> Never forget the you know, comparison. Well, anyhow. You I'll, had a half hour left. Oh, is that so? Oh, my God, I'm just starting. <laughs> Well, we, we, to make it short, uh, we broke through France. My division was the type that would go through the German lines and then the foot infantry would come back and mop up. Well, we were surrounded many times. One time we were surrounded and uh, we couldn't get any food or anything. And that's the time I pulled the cookie tins, tins out. And I uh, divided up among the fellas, and the fellas started chewing on the cookies, and they spit it out. And then they started chewing on the candy, and they spit it out. Then they took cigarettes, tried to smoke, and they couldn't smoke. You know why? We had soap in it, in the cans. We didn't realize. What did we know? And it permeated, you know, everything. Well, nearby was the French village, and the we gave all that stuff to the French. The French kids, they enjoyed the cooking can. Mm -hmm. They hadn't had any yeah. since the Germans invaded France. The only good thing we had that was, was the soap, <laughs> and we certainly could use that. Uh, we came up to the Moselle River, and we had a tough time getting over it. We finally did. As a matter of fact, one of my friends, took a picture of General Patton who came up to see what was going on where we were. And nobody ever expected him to be that close to the front line, but he was there, right? Uh, Excuse me, the, uh, that's a, a story, Johnny tells the story of yeah. crossing the Moselle River, what Patton did, I'll tell you when the tape is over, because I don't want to use it for yeah. tape time. Well, I can tell you what Patton did, but I don't want to tell you. Well, he's told me. Oh, he told you that story? <laughs> I got a big picture. He told me that story. Yeah. See, he he was in the tanks. He yeah. was the head of the tanks. Yeah. He was in engineering. Uh-huh. So they yeah. fixed the, the roads and the bridges oh, sure. for you to come over. That's right. And we appreciated what they did. Yeah. Uh, then we finally got all the ammunition and as we went, <clears throat> we went ahead through Alsace-Lorraine. We got up to the German border, and just as we got across the German border in a town called Salzdorf. Now this is in Salzburg. A lot of people. Yeah. Uh, this is a small town. I think it was a salt mining town originally. And uh, company commander called us in. He said, "Now." We know there are Germans up on the top of the hill. We don't know how many. And he uh, told the 
10 ahead of my outfit. He said, I want you to take that hill. So we got up to the line there, the bottom of the hill, and we set up a line. And the lieutenant called me and he says, Sergeant, he says, I want you to take your squad and go up and take that hill. What could I do? I said, sure, yes, sir. So I called my squad. I said, spread out. We're going up to the hill there and take them. So we got about halfway up the hill, and the Germans got up behind the bank from there, and they started firing at us. And I said, boys, let's go. Let's go get them. You know, when you're in the service, half the time you don't know what you're doing. The training is what caused that. So I started running up, and I got hit in the head. You can see my ear. You can see it's... There's a meditation there, and I still have shrapnel in my neck and head here. And uh, I was running up. Well, I started bleeding. I looked back to see my fellows, and either half of them were already on the ground, or the other half were running back. I said, there's no place for me. <laughs> I better get back. I can't take the whole German army. So I got back there, and they bandaged my head up, and I went back in the front line. And we were shooting away, you know, firing away at the end. Then I got hit in the wrist. And uh, they gave me first aid. And they carried me back to uh, the uh, division MDs. And the doctor there, he operated on my arm. He said, you're going back. You're going to England. So they drove me to Toul, France, T-O-U-L, which is a point of, uh, they took the wounded soldiers and flew them back to England. So we got on a plane, a, a small plane, the first time I'd ever been on an airplane. And uh, although going over the English Channel was a rough thing, I enjoyed the whole way because I was getting away from the battlefield. I figured I had done my duty. So we got to England and they put me in a hospital in Salisbury, England, which wasn't very far from where I had trained. And uh, I was there for from September until December where I had treatment. And they put us on a boat, a hospital boat going back to the States. We landed in New York City uh, just before Christmas, and they placed me in the hospital in Staten Island called Halloran General Hospital. It was a great place being near Manhattan. So when Christmas came, they said all GIs who could stand up and walk could get a three-day pass if they lived no more than 50 miles from uh, New York City. Well, I lived about 250 miles, but I stood up. First time I was able to get out, the bed, I held on to it, and they gave me a pass. But they did carry me on a stretcher from the hospital to uh, uh, Grand Central. And uh, once I got on the train, I could walk pretty good. did very well. And I got back to my hometown of Brockton, Massachusetts, Christmas Eve, and uh, well, what happened, I, I the train uh, uh, left me off at Providence, I'm going to Boston, coming back to Brockton, I got off to Providence, somewhere that right now, which is about 40 miles from Brockton, and the bus stopped downtown in front of the shoe store that I had once worked in. I got off and banged on the door. They were having the Christmas party. And they saw me, that was the end of the party. <laughs> you know, they, they didn't know what happened. And they knew I'd been wounded. But I got home and uh, that was quite a, a welcome. And I went back to uh, Hallam General Hospital and they told us we're going to go to a another hospital we can get better treatment. How, how much? Longer? Go ahead, you bet. So they told us, now when you get on the train going to your 
destination. Uh, we want you to be extremely careful because there are women in the war. They had told us we're going to go to hospitals near our home. So what do we find out? We're going to Memphis, Tennessee, to uh, Kennedy General Hospital down there. Well, I got down there. I was there a few months. They uh, operated on me, and they gave me a a three-month furlough. So I took the train back to uh, Boston, but I stopped off in Atlanta to visit my sister. I liked the lamp and it looked pretty good to me. The climate was great, you know. So when I got up to New York City, I developed a horrible pain in my wrist where they had worked on. And I went, immediately went over back to Howard and General Hospital. They put me in bed and started giving me penicillin around the clock and whatnot. I developed osteomyelitis in my they kind of cleared that up. And then I developed something that they didn't know too much about. I started itching all over and breaking out no matter where. I couldn't shave for a few days. I couldn't comb my hair. couldn't even stand up. They didn't know what it was. They, they tried everything. They even thought I might have a venereal disease. They checked me on that and they found that was so. so what happened about that time, Bastogne happened, the Battle of Bastogne, and they were sending all the doctors from the hospitals here, as many as they could spare over there, and they were using civilian doctors coming in from the city to the hospital. Doctors at the hospital never could find out. So they brought in a civilian, I remember him as an old Italian dermatologist, one of the old type. New York. He looked at me and he said, what kind of medication are they giving you? I said, they're giving me penicillin around the clock. He says, well, why don't you do this? Tell them not to give it to you for a day or so. See what happens. Well, we did that and it cleared up almost instantly. I had one of the early penicillin reactions. I have you know what I went through. Well, anyhow, that cleared up. They decided to send me to another hospital. They sent me to uh, uh, Camp, Camp Edwards General Hospital in Cape Cod, which was about 30 miles from my home. So I went, uh, got on the train one Saturday evening, headed for uh, Camp Edwards, and I didn't feel well once I got on the train. And I, I was subject to ulcers, and I thought maybe that's what it was. I couldn't eat anything. So I, ordered some ice cream on the train, and I couldn't have that either. I mean, that I, I knew something was deadly wrong if I couldn't minutes. take ice cream. You had 15 minutes. Yeah. So I went to, I, I landed in uh, at Camp Edward General Hospital. It was a Saturday night, and almost everybody was out. Uh, all the doctors had the weekend off. It seemed to be nobody was there. But there was one officer in charge, he was a doctor, medic, and he said to me, you don't feel well? I said, no. It just so happened, he was a brother of one of my kid brother's best friend who was going to Brown University at that That's time. So, so he said to me, I'll tell you what you do, let me give you a pass to go home, I know you live nearby, now you come back Monday morning. So I went home, my sister looked at me and she said, I'm going to call our family doctor. She called Dr. Barron in and he looked at me and said, you better go right back to camp, you got hepatitis. So I went back to camp and I was in bed there for about six months before uh, you never get over that, you're always you know, tired, you're you know what I'm saying. And uh, then they decided to send me to uh, uh, a hospital in Framingham, Massachusetts. It had been named after a famous doctor. The name escapes me at the moment, but he was the father-in-law of uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt's son, one of his sons there. And uh, I was.
was there for a while getting treatment, you know. And uh, they called me in, a group of doctors. They were going to check, see how I was doing. One of them says, I think maybe we ought to send him over to North Dakota or South Dakota. I said to him, if you send me there, I, I'm going over the hill. He was laughing. He said, no, we're going to let you go. I've been in the service almost five years, two years of which was in the Army hospitals. And I finally got out in uh, 1946. After the war. After the war, a year after the war. All my buddies had already been out, and I had more points than they did, yeah. and here I was in the service. And uh, I got home, and my, I came back to a land to visit my sister here. My sister's husband said to me, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know. They want me back in, at my company that I work for. They're expanding. But I said, I can't do much in my arm. He said, well, I'll tell you, my father-in-law here has a grocery and he's doing pretty well and he wants to retire. Why don't you take it over? See how you do. You make it fairly good living. I said, let me think about it. So I went back home. I really didn't think much about it, frankly. What did I know about groceries? So I get a call from him a few weeks later. He said, I have to come on down here. My father has got to sell on. So I went down, and he sort of talked me into it. I said, I don't know anything about it. He said, well, you've got help. You'll learn. So I figured I'd take it, uh, try it for a few months, and I Can did. Can you kind of hurry, the yeah. tape's going to run out. And, uh, and I find I liked it, and, but I still had opportunities to go back north. But uh, then I, I met my wife, and uh, she said, uh, uh, we won't go north. We may go south, but we won't go mm -hmm. north, and that's why I'm still in the land. <laughs> okay. And so that's how the war changed your life, too. You well, yeah, life. of course. That was an extreme change. <laughs> well, you know, it's... Let me turn this off. Any more questions? Uh, it's tape is running out. Oh, it's now. gone. Okay. Didn't even take the tape out, you know. Let's see, then it says record. Record.